So we were talking about whether my wife's Corolla can ascend that hill on Walter Reed Drive. Does anyone need a copy of this thing that we were doing? I have a couple left. You're welcome. Although it is perhaps familiar to talk about the sound that the engine makes when the, it's trying very hard, we decided that we wanted to, this was like two weeks ago at this point, so we just want to rehash a little bit. We decided that we should maybe define this thing called work. Originally, we just wanted to quantify effort over distance. How hard are we trying by applying a force to push a thing a particular distance? And eventually that had consequences. We had to chase down what it meant to multiply two things that are both directional. And we agreed that some math to do that, we could invent. According to our needs, we could invent the scalar product, which explains the cosine in the formula for work if you look it up in our textbook. And then now that we have this new quantity, we asked a little bit more of it and ended up deciding that it was if we include information about Newton's second law because that's like the only that's the thing we keep returning to from now until ever it seems like there's a force maybe we get to say something about Newton's second law uh, and in fact we can and if we do if we talk about the net force in relation to a displacement we end up talking about the, the character of the motion of this object. If effort, right, if, if work is done, then it's to change the motion of the object. In other words, the kinetic energy of the object. And we define this thing right at the end in like the extra two minutes uh, that, that I stole from you on whenever that was a week ago. So we never really got a chance to work with, uh, to practice with kinetic energy. Uh, so I suppose we should do that now. Straightforward at first. An object with a mass of 90 kilograms is traveling at seven meters per second. How much kinetic energy does it have? Well, I have a rule for kinetic energy. We're just putting in mass and velocity. Yep. So whatever 45 times 49 is, let's see, 45 times 50 uh, would be 45, half of 4,500. So that's 2,250 less 45. So it's 2,205. You gotta check my arithmetic on that. It's been a long day. It's in joules. It is in joules. How do you know that? Um, the kilograms times mass over second squared. 
Mass squared over second squared is four. Yes, which was originally defined as our unit for work. But this thing here says that work and kinetic energy have to have the same units. So, yep, absolutely. 2,205 joules. Questions, comments, concerns? All right. An object of mass 30 kilograms falls here on Earth from rest 100 meters. Calculate the net work done on the object if we ignore air resistance. The net work done is the sum of all the work. It's the work done by all of the acting forces. But if this is a thing that's falling and we're ignoring the air, what's the only acting force? Gravity. So we need the work done by gravity. And then we reach for our definition. Uh, let's see, where did I put it? There it is. The work done by gravity should be the force of gravity dot the displacement. That's only referring to gravity? Sorry? That's only referring to gravity? The definition there? This? Yeah. No, it's oh. the work done by any force. Oh, by any force. Okay. So if you want the work done by gravity, then the force we should use okay. is gravity. Okay. Okay, so is the dot multiplication? Or it is, yeah. Okay. But it's the multiplication of vectors, okay. which we only know how to do at this point if we can put them on a number line, if we can make them parallel, and that's what cosine's job is. All right, so we follow the rules for calculating work, and it's the force that we're talking about, dot the displacement that we're talking about. So, in the application of the scalar product that we put together last time, whenever this was a week ago, <clears throat> we need the magnitude of the force of gravity. which is the weight of the object. We need the magnitude of the displacement, which is 100 meters. And then we need the cosine of the angle between the direction of gravity and the direction of the displacement. But they're both down. Gravity acts down, and this thing is moving down. So the angle between them is zero, right? If two directions are the same, what's the angle between them? None. So we can safely multiply our 30 kilogram mass by 9.8 times 100. Sorry. Um is are we using the weight specifically for gravity or is there any different occurrences for it? Like different different um ways we represent the force if it's a different force. If so it isn't just gravity, then I won't know that it is mg. I'll have to find the force some other way. Okay. So you want the magnitude of the force, and for in this case, it's the weight. Right. the The magnitude of gravity is the weight of the object. Okay. Wait. Okay. So for the magnitude of gravity, is it nine point eight or is it or is it the weight? Um, the the weight is the mass times g. G. Right. right. So. Is that what you're? Yeah. 
the magnitude of the force of gravity. Right? We need to know how much is how much force is gravity applying. Mm -hmm. So that isn't just 9.8 because that's an acceleration. Mm -hmm. If we want a force, then we need kilogram meter per second squared. So we've got to multiply by the mass. Okay. Nine point eight times three is twenty nine point four. So it's two hundred ninety four hundred. Thumbs? Okay. The velocity of the object as it hits the ground, or I don't know about the ground, but at the end of having fallen 100 meters at any rate. Use the work energy theorem, not kinematics. So if we have the energy, can we use the joules we just got and plug in the mass to get velocity? Pretty much. Yep. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm just going to write it this way. The work energy theorem tells us that the work that's done should be equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. But we just found the left hand side. We found the net work. It's only the work done by gravity. We know what it is. It's 29,400. The change in the kinetic energy is what it is at the end minus what it was at the beginning, which was. Zero. Because. Oh, the velocity was zero? Yes. Oh, oh, okay. So if the velocity was zero, so was the kinetic right. energy. Okay. So we plug in the mass and solve. Is it, yeah, essentially. We just got to make sure that the factor of two and the square root get. Two times Questions, comments, concerns? So we're just trusting that it's meters per second? I think so. This would be joules, but divide away the kilograms, which should leave us with meters squared yeah. per second squared, and then we take the square root. Cool. Could we have used kinematics? Yeah, actually, we could have. Uh, for this scenario, I think either choice makes, I, I think both are good choices. Could we do this? Sure. Could we do the other thing? Sure. 
for other situations. We may like very much want to use energy considerations instead of kinematics. Would you have an option to do that on an exam? Yeah. Well, I mean, if I'm really interested in um, assessing use of energy and work as concepts and analytical tools, then I might tell you, you got to use the work energy theorem, not kinematics. But generally, yeah, we've got to trust. All right. I'd actually like to skip the next page and go on to the very last one. Because we're this close to actually answering the question that started this whole thing about the Corolla and the hill on Walter Reed Drive. There's one more piece of this puzzle. Kinetic friction is whatever it is, right? It, it, it doesn't have the inequality in it. If you are sliding, then kinetic friction is so and so strong, right? If I push this chair across the room at constant velocity, I do some amount of work. What if I do the same job twice as fast? But the trouble is, I apply a force over a distance, and the force I need to use to make a constant velocity happen is the same because friction doesn't change no matter how fast you're going. If you are sliding, then friction is what it is. So in either case, having a constant velocity and applying the force I need to maintain a constant velocity means I do the same amount of work, whether I'm doing the job quickly or slowly. But aren't you spending more energy? Kind of. As far as work and energy goes, no. But you're right that one of them is harder to do, right? If you turn up the speed on a treadmill, I get tired a lot faster. But it's still like mechanically running. It takes the same amount of like energy to do, right? It's just faster now. So doing the same job, but faster. So you said constant velocity and um, apply like continued applied force is gonna so like whether I push slowly or I push quickly, if I'm doing it at constant velocity, friction is the same strength either way. So my applied force has to be the same strength either way. It's just one of them takes half the time. Up until now, we haven't talked about time. And we really should. Ow. Uh -oh. <laughs> and we really should because walking up a flight of stairs and running up a flight of stairs are very different. But as far as everything we've said so far, they're the same. So you'd like to bring into the picture time. So as far as work, we're doing the same job. We're just interested in the rate at which you do that job. We'd like 
the rate at which work is done. To talk about the way it feels to do the same amount of work faster. Faster means time. So the so the same amount of work overall will be done, but it can be done at different rates. Right. Okay. How much work did you do? And how long did it take to do it? So are we not really involving energy at this point? Well, work and energy are very closely related. the rate at which work is done. So and so much work per time. If delta T becomes smaller, to do the same job, to push the chair twice as fast, it takes half the time, this quantity increases like we want. I'd like to call this power. For which I'll use a capital P. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you not only said we're just like making stuff up to go, are these actually the equations that we see? Yeah. But when I say that we're just making shit up, I'm I'm trying very hard to position each new thing that we write down, each new definition, as a reasonable thing for us to have thought to do. There are scenarios that are not adequately sort of, my experience of pushing the chair faster isn't well described by work or kinetic energy. I need a new thing. What's different? The time. All right, so I'll build in the time. That it's a natural thing to do to write this um, instead of kind of what the textbooks sometimes do is just say power is defined this way. You're like, what the, what the fuck? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Work is defined as force displacement cosine of theta. What the fuck? Theta? Who said anything about theta? <laughs> All right, so what are the units of power? Um, kilograms per time. I'm gonna I'm gonna run it back and we'll make it even worse. I was talking to my dad once. Uh, and this the, the this story sort of informs if you wonder why I am the way I am, it's because uh so I was talking to my dad once and he said something I didn't understand him. So I said, what? Like you do. And he repeated himself. I still didn't understand him. I said, what? And he said, are you a light bulb? And I said, what? <laughs> he said, you're giving off what? What? <laughs> <laughs> so dad just you're just getting ready for February 2nd. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was right. Joules per second, I'd like to define as watts. Oh. So should we mark it differently than work? Or are we not really going to be writing work? <sighs> I have to apologize. It turns out that W is just a problematic symbol, no matter what you do. <laughs> like, it's the symbol for the quantity work. It's also the representation for the unit. What? If you turn it upside down, it's still a problem. M is the symbol for the quantity mass and also the symbol for the unit meters. It's just, it's just a problem. <laughs> It's just a thing. I, I it's it's not the first time we've had this sort of dual purpose symbol. M has in fact meant mass and meters depending, uh, and it's just a thing we have to be careful of. Okay. 
for which I apologize, um, but which I can do nothing about. It's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, it's James Watts. I think his name's James. Uh, it's James Watts' fault um, it, because he was the first to uh, actually determine the average power output of a horse and call it horsepower. We named the unit of power after him. <laughs> is that three lines in the middle? It is, yeah. Uh, three line equals it is defined to be. Nobody told us anything about watts. We're just going to make it up. Oh, like the set two thing? Or, right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay. It's, it's not equal mathematically, it's equal because we said so. Mm -hmm. okay. Strictly speaking, that should have one too. Is that's, that, that's a definition. Is there a reason why it's in brackets? Units instead of symbols. Oh, oh. That's that's the way that I try to keep straight when there's some ambiguity that the stuff in braces is unit symbols and the stuff without is actual physical quantities. Oh. Otherwise, there would be very little way to tell. But to cross multiply power times delta t, that helps explain why the units of the electrical energy that are delivered to your home are billed in kilowatt hours. Kilowatt? Kilowatt hours. So a thousand watts per Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> kilowatt. Yeah. So wait, how many? What is a thousand watts? Like the T, or like how does it go? Depends on how much time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Give me an example. Like I'm trying <laughs> to make a baseline in my head. Like, what is ten watts in an hour? Right, right. So uh, you know, uh, uh, an incandescent bulb is a, maybe a sixty watt bulb. So that per hour. Well, it's. Watts energy energy spent per time. So how do they like what time is it for a light bulb? Like if a light bulb is 100 watts, right? 100 okay. watt light bulb. What time did they measure to be like? So, well, okay, so it's, it's however long you had it on. But suppose you ran a 100 watt light bulb uh -huh. for five hours. Right. Okay. So that's 100 watts times five hours is 500 joules. What? Or, or, or joules. it's oh. actually, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not joules. The seconds is right there. It's, that's not, it, it's gotta be watt hours at that point. It's 500 watt hours, which is half a kilowatt hour. Uh, so how do they know for, how do they know how many watts of light bulbs can get off? That's what I'm trying to ask. Like, what was measured to be like this is 100 watt light bulb? It's either the uh, brightness of the light given off or the uh, electrical current that runs through the circuit with the light bulb in it and the um, voltage of the battery that's running that current. Mm -hmm. So if, if you had, um, you plug into the wall, it's 120 volts. What is a volt? Yeah, that we're, we're getting <laughs> far away from. <laughs> Are we gonna be talking about kilowatts and, and? Not in electrical terms. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, 202. Oh, so, what is joules over seconds? Yes. Um, how many seconds? Is it one second? That's what I'm saying. Like, what is the base? Well, no. Uh, one joule. Uh, joule per second is a uh, watt. A one. Oh. 
that means watts are uh, when you have a hundred watt bulb, that means seconds as well. Like right. I, I, anytime you have watts, you also have joules per second. Yep. So wait, if you had a hundred watt bulb, would that mean not a thousand joules per second? No. no. That would mean you had a hundred watts per second. Well, I'm sorry, a hundred joules per second. So joules per second is directly equivalent to, to how watts. Watt. Okay. Yes. I'd like to unpack this definition just a little bit. Work we define as force times displacement. Mm -hmm. Displacement over time is what again? Absolutely, for velocity. That's the flavor of power that we're going to need to talk about the Corolla going uphill. To maintain 30 miles an hour, how much force does the engine need to exert? That's directly related to how much power the engine can supply. So we needed that F dot V in order to answer the question about the Corolla. So we're going to need two north directions because they're vectors, but they're going the same way. Right? They're almost always going the same way. Oh, right. So do you have to say an overall direction or? The it doesn't really matter as, as long as the force and the velocity are the same the dot product just says okay multiply oh. technically it's a dot product and although the textbook won't tell you that i i'm you know i trust you with it so would you want us to always do just like f for v or like if we want it to keep you broken that like to keep it broken like keep it as the distance over time like, this one we did that one? yeah um, beneficial? and it depends what we're given and what we're asked for okay. suppose so suppose there were there were a problem about a motor that is expressed in kilowatt hours, an electrical motor that we're delivering electrical power to kilowatt hours. And this motor is going to apply a force on something of um, 10 newtons or whatever. What displacement could we get out of so and so many kilowatt hours of delivered power or delivered energy something something like that so like oh, yeah. you where we might actually want to leave the, the displacement there to unpack the solve for it yep for our purposes here because we're specifically talking about a car going at speed i'm going to keep this version mm -hmm. My head is like very screwed. Like I'm in pain. I think I'm about to get a migraine. Okay. Um, how long is this next problem gonna take? Because I want to stay through it, but like it's gonna take like a while. I might have to leave because I usually throw up with my migraines, and I definitely do not want to just run out while we're talking about your Corolla. <laughs> I. I. Uh, it'll be maybe ten minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but if you do have to 
Yeah. Then please do. Yeah. Um, so. It is being recorded, right? So you can always come back to it. I might want to come back to it. I usually, um, they're either like hereditary, and I always get like auras, so like spots in them, and I think I can tell when it's happening. All right. So I'm going to okay. not throw up the phone. What do we have? The Corolla. We have a 17 degree hill, I think, back at the beginning. A 17 degree incline. Seventeen degree incline, we have a car. Kind of I, I guess, yeah. Uh, there. And okay. The engine provides one hundred twenty six horsepower. Is horsepower the same as regular power? No. Horsepower is an official unit. It's equal to so and so many watts. And I don't remember the conversion. Well, that's all right. So we'll get to it. Horsepower is in watts. Horsepower is not watts. Yeah, it's like 120 watts. Or I, I forget. Well, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. It's a conversion. It's a conversion. Yeah. Conversion of watts. Okay. But that's, that's not the whole story. Okay. So it's an old car at this point. It was a 2006, and this was only like four years ago. So let's out of, of the 126 that the engine is um, factory supposed to be capable of, only 75% of it is actually getting to the drivetrain. Okay. There are there is air resistance on the car. They do a lot to try to minimize it, but there is some. And there's a little bit of extra friction maybe to account for it. So altogether, let's say that 700 Newtons altogether is pushing on the car to try to impede its motion just all the time. Okay. So this is down the hill or on top of the hill? Uh, in opposite the direction we're going. So we're going uphill. So, so this all stuff is pointing down. Okay. Yep. The car has a factory weight of 2,550 pounds, and there is one 220 pound person in it. Bro, why are we doing pounds all of a sudden? Because it's horsepower. <laughs> We've got all kinds of, we got Newtons and pounds in the same problem. Fun. Oh, and miles per hour, because the speed limit on Walter Reed Drive is 30 miles an hour. So what, you can't break the speed limit? I just want to stay at the speed limit. But well, what if that's not enough to get up the hill? I'm worried about even keeping that much. Damn. I blame James Watts. I think that's fair. <laughs> I think that's fair. OK. The clue here is the force that's acting against us. Mm -hmm. That the fact that this is here, I'm, I'm conditioned like Pavlov's dog, a free body diagram. Got to draw one. Somebody said force. I got to draw a free body diagram. What are the acting forces? Air resistance. Air resistance and friction all together are pushing down hill. Yeah, so they uh, 700 resistance, all that crap. What else? Gravity. Gravity. Vertically down, yeah? yeah. What 
Wouldn't there be normal force? Normal force. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to close. Hold on. This will be that close. Normal force. What else? That's that's, all that? oh. yeah. let's, let's rope that into the resistive forces. So applied force? The applied force, the engine, right? Oh, but we don't know what that means. Technically, it's actually friction. Friction drives your truck. What? Oh. Because oh, it pushes it backwards so it can go right. forward. Yeah. Your car is trying to turn the wheels. And so the rubber is trying to move backwards. Friction pushes forwards. It's friction that moves your car. So you mean cars push the earth back and not forward? Yes. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> it's like Futurama. Yeah, with the spaceship. If if friction didn't exist, nothing would fucking work. Oh man. I, I, I couldn't take a step if there weren't friction. Because, so oh. yeah, your back foot would slide out from under you. Well, unless gravity wasn't a thing. Maybe. I mean, if, if, if it is or isn't, it doesn't matter. It's like trying to walk on perfectly smooth ice. I'm not going to be able, I can't. There's nothing to do. Right. I, I could maybe pick up a foot, but if I tried to move forward at all, but there was no gravity. That's my foot's still gonna slip out from under me because I, I have to push to move the bulk of my oh. body. I need to move it forwards. And the only way to do that is to find something to push on me, and that's friction. Oh. If friction oh. weren't a thing, we couldn't write with pencils. Because it wouldn't, it would just float away. Right, it would just slide. <laughs> so, so imagine the graph like just like running down the floor. It's it's so weird. We, we spend so much time ignoring friction. Yeah. Nothing would fucking work. <laughs> it's fascinating to me. It's actually friction that drives your car, which explains why we're so concerned about wet pavement. Because it can't grip to the thing. Exactly. But I'm going to paper over that because the kind of friction associated with rolling car tires is actually kind of hard to talk about. So we're just going to say that it's the force that the engine needs to exert. E for the engine. So we're not calling it applied force. Wait. You could if you wanted to. Oh. Applied force, sure. I just specifically want to say that it's the engine. Okay, so I'll be drawing it like this way. If the applied force goes this way, is the diagram wrong? Does it matter? Because I mean, they're still doing that, but like the other way. Right. Was, so if, can I so that if that's if if it's clear what what all what all forces are acting on what object uh -huh. to you to draw it that way, then it's fine. Okay. For me, because I'm used to drawing it this way, where all the arrows start at the thing that is being acted upon. Okay. And they point in their respective directions according to who's who's point. trying to get this to do what. It, that way would confuse me. But if it works for you, then that's great. I mean, I'm just learning it. So is that is that way better to do it that way? Because I don't have a preference. I think so, but that's that's my personal preference. The the textbook would recommend that way. this way also. The the arrows all start at the object and point away in the direction that that force acts. Okay. What do you think about coordinate systems? You want to turn it? Mm 
All right, well, in that case, we're going to need components of gravity. G Y and then G X. That more. Okay. Again, I'm conditioned. I drew a free body diagram, so I'm supposed to write the second one. There are one, two, three arrows. The engine points uphill, gravity, and the resistive stuff point downhill. What is the horiz What is the x acceleration? Yeah. Okay, so how come f of g is slanted, but not the natural slope? Not natural. What is it called? Normal. Normal. Because surfaces only know how to push perpendicular to themselves. The road, the slanted road, can only push perpendicular to it. Oh, but not. It's not to gravity. It's still what it's on. Right. Off. Oh. Right. Gravity is just towards the center of the Earth. Got you. So the normal force is whatever surface we're on. Okay. Do we know the acceleration? Um, seventy five percent of something. <laughs> and then I don't know if you can break that up until, until you get acceleration. Oh, zero. Never mind. I think it ought to be zero because we want to maintain a constant speed. Cool. You know what's nice here? We don't need to worry about mu. We don't need to worry about what the normal force is equal to. We were just told how much friction altogether acts against us. Friction, air resistance, all that crap. We don't need to unpack it. We just know it. Yeah. So since the acceleration is zero, that's why we don't need the MA of Y. We don't need it because we aren't asked about it. Okay. We would also know that that's zero, that because acceleration. It's not moving off. Right. Just, okay. uh, so if we needed to know what the normal force was equal to, we could find it. It's got to be equal and opposite the y component of gravity. But since no one asked us about to unpack friction, like with a coefficient or anything, we don't need it. So how much force does the engine need to exert to do this? The x component of gravity plus the 700 newtons why pushing against this. Sorry? Why is that? Why is what? Like, where did you get all that from? Oh, the FGX, this red arrow. Huh. We know the purple hypotenuse is MG. And to get this side, it's the opposite side of the triangle. Yeah, but you said that F equals this. Yeah, because the right hand side is zero. So I just move those two terms to the other side. Okay. So that's oh, why oh, oh, okay. I thought you were saying that the engine, the force of the engine is okay. We, we don't know that until just now. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. All right. I know the weight, the total weight is 2,770 pounds. I happen to know that here on Earth, one kilogram 
weighs 2.2 pounds. And I like that because I also know how much one kilogram weighs. And that's 9.8 newtons. So we can make that conversion. And then we know how much force the engine needs to exert to do this. Let's see, 2770 divided by 2.2 times 9.8. 12,000 newtons. Oh, wait. Ooh, shit. That was almost bad. I almost multiplied by G again. This is already newtons. This is already Newtons. I don't need to multiply 12,000 by G. That's going to get me oh, some weird thing. No. So G is gravity? G is the magnitude of the acceleration due to gravity. Lowercase g is 9.8. But in this case, it's already baked in because we already have Newtons. We already know purple. We already know the entire weight of the thing in Newtons. If we wanted to talk about the mass, how many kilograms, we'd have to unpack and undivide or undivide and divide by 9.8 to get back to kilograms. So we're mg, it's already ready already. So M, so I always thought of Newton's as force, but I guess that MG is the magnitude of a force. Yeah. Well, yes. Okay. But a, a force vector and a magnitude of a force have the same units. It's just one of them has a direction. Which one of them? If, if we're talking about magnitude, we don't need a direction. But the force of do the, the force with which gravity acts is 12,330 or 12,339 newtons. Mm -hmm. In which direction? Down. So is the sine theta the direction? No. Or is that not oh, okay? So that's just what we need to talk about the red component of it. Oh, okay. Okay. So it's just a matter of like the magnitude. So we have accounted for its direction. So anymore, oh, I only want magnitudes. Yeah. I, I don't want to start plugging in information about its direction because we've already, the coordinate system took yeah. care of all that for us. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that first conversion is just making it into kilograms, right? Yes. And then the second one is putting it into newtons. newtons. And then we need that to put in the mg. Like it's already in newtons. So yeah, I, like I don't want to multiply thing. again by G is what I'm saying. So do we still need to multiply it by sine theta? Yes. Okay. So that whole thing is MG, right? Like the 12,000. Yes. Okay. Perhaps less confusingly, let's just divide by 2.2 and call that kilograms. That's M. That's the mass. Right. And then we can plug that in, multiply by 9.8 like we did. And yeah. Does that mean Newton's has always been mass times gravity? We never really talked about this. Well, mass times gravity, mass times the uh, acceleration due to gravity has the units of Newton's. Okay. Wait, so. Exactly. Wait. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay, so what is a Newton? We already did that already. <laughs> uh, Newton is the unit of force. And force is kilograms per meter per second squared. Uh, yet uh, almost. Almost. It's what not kilograms it? per meters. It's kilograms times meters. Times meters per second squared. So the whole thing divided by second squared. Yes. Meters oh. squared over second squared, right? Joules, not newtons. Oh wait, were we talking? Oh, we're talking. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> wait, how did you go from the first equation? From this to this? Yeah. The FGX. We know that, let me, let me write it this way. So 
if what we want is f g x, we can cross multiply. The force that gravity acts with is the weight, and we know that that's mg. Every time we write f sub g without any direction or uh, component indicator, it's mg. Who's got the arithmetic? One seventeen. Four thousand three hundred seven point six. Nice. Oh wow! Literally, how do you do this? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sign seventeen. I uh, you know. That's one I had memorized. No. no. I do have a stupid quantity of numbers memorized. Like, uh, I thought it was fun at one point to memorize the decimal equivalents for all the fractions with single digit denominators. Are you serious? Yeah. Wait, wow. Wait. Yeah. Uh, sevenths are the worst. Wait, give me an example because I'm trying to understand what you're saying. So like uh, seven ninths okay. is 0. 0.77777 repeat. Okay. The ninths are fun because it's whatever the numerator is repeating. Oh. Really? Oh. So wait, three ninths is three three. Oh yeah. shit. <laughs> That's so crazy. <laughs> um, sevenths are the worst. You know, you know how sometimes. Uh, if we want to represent pi, we use 22 sevenths mm -hmm. because sevenths are the worst decimals. It approximates so pi and it doesn't finish. So you can't memorize the sevenths? Even you can, it's like 0. 0.143 is a seven. Oh, okay. That's, That's such a good pastime. I'm actually learning stuff. You know what I do with pastime? Yeah. Not I just, shit. Like, remember numbers. Sleep. I, I have. Um, I have said in the past, I have a head for numbers and not much else. <laughs> like, I still have my, like, mine and my mom's library barcode numbers memorized. I worked at the library, like, part time. So there's a little bit of a justification for that. But they have since changed the barcode system. The numbers don't mean fucking anything anymore, but they're still in my head. Wow. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I just I just like numbers. So you know what I was since we're on this subject, you know what I was surprised about? Elevenths have a pattern. Yeah. Let's uh, suppose you want three elevenths. Take the numerator, fact one. And then the next digit is whatever you would need to add to get nine. It's 0. 0.27 repeating. Oh my god. That's cool. Right? Yeah. I was, I was consistent for every single for every eleventh. Yeah. Wow. I did it on my calculator. How'd you find that out? I happened to notice and it was like, wow, that's weird. It's got a pattern. That's cool. Wow. Fractions, I mean, I don't know, man. Fractions are, are, fractions are great. Fractions are your best friend. Are they though? Yeah. Because you can cancel them. Oh, yeah, that's true. Right? I don't want to multiply by 11 if I don't have to. If I got an 11 in the denominator, I'm, I'm golden. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, what are we talking about? The car. Yes, the car. The Corolla. The uh all right so we've got a force and we are close to having the velocity with which we need to move we just need um a series how 
how many meters per second is 30 miles per hour? 30 miles per hour is 13.41 meters per second. Thanks. <laughs> it's a computer. What do you want? <laughs> 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 57,000 what? Right. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not. Not. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> exactly. So, all right. What does that have to do with the engine? I don't know, man. This number is the number that we need. We need to be able to get this much from the engine because this is associated with the force that we need to maintain 13.41 meters per second up this hill. So this is our requirement. We have to hit this. If we don't, the Corolla is gonna slow down. Right. Oh, so what we got before is insufficient? Or no, 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 no. Ignore me. Okay. So is that the answer? Is that more? We're, we're close because we haven't used the 75% or the 126 horsepower. All right. So in order to tell this story, we need to make sure that the power output is at least equal to the power requirement. So this is the requirement. Yeah. So if this is the requirement and nothing less would work, what are we looking for? I just want to see if we satisfy the inequality. Are we good or are we not? In fact, I know that we are good because I have traveled Walter B. Drive in the Corolla before, but our guiding questions actually had to do with, where did it go? For a given speed limit, how much steeper could the hill be before the Corolla wouldn't do it? Oh, that's the question. And vice versa. For like, if the hill stays 17, how fast can the speed be before the Corolla can't maintain it? Um... We just need to know, uh... hey Siri. How many watts is 126 horsepower? 126 horsepower is 92,672.87 watts. Mm -hmm. So how much is one? Uh, 126 is that number. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if I'm going to look it up anyway, I'm not going to look up the conversion. I'm just going to ask Google to tell me what it's equal to. And, and what, what was the other conversion you did for? Uh, how, many, uh, how many meters per second in a uh, Not how many. So we know that the speed limit is 30 miles an hour. So we got to convert miles an hour to meters per second. Oh, oh. Oh, does it say 30 miles an hour in the first case? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. We can only get. 75% of that 92,000 watts, though, because the car is old. Horsepower is British? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are miles. Are they really? Yeah, so are inches. I mean, the inch, an inch is the length of the king's thumbnail. I don't know, and I don't really know what happened when the king changed either. And a foot is this foot? I guess. Okay. The English system. Is it really? The English system makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't get over how long the way to spin it is. <laughs> 
And it just walked into my <laughs> All right, so we can actually get sixty nine thousand five hundred and four point six five. I guess watts. That's how much actually makes it to the drivetrain to actually propel the car forward. Okay, so that means we're good. Yeah, what did you say? 69,504, which is 75% of what the car is actually rated to give. Where, where? This where 126 this? horsepower is that number. It took 75%. That's 75%. That's oh. what actually gets output by the engine. And in fact, it is greater than 57,765. So yes, our math bears out my personal experience that the Corolla makes it uphill. But this 57,000 is a direct result of the speed and the force we need. And the force we need is dependent on the angle. So we have to do our optimization of Kind of. We don't need to do any calculus. But suppose we keep a 17 degree hill so that we need 4,307 newtons. How fast could we go before the result was more than we were going to get? Mm, 16 miles per second. Yeah, pretty much. It's like 16 and a half meters per second. <laughs> if we're going to be able to get 69,000, and we need 4,307.6, 16.1 meters per second. Any faster than uh, 16.1. Instead of 30 miles an hour, if it's, well, 16.1 corresponds to right about 36 miles an hour. If the speed limit on Malta Reed was 40 miles an hour here, the Corolla could not do it. Could not get up this hill at 40 miles an hour. Isn't capable. And if it does, what happens? Oh, I don't know. We break the space time continuum. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. About like are these 40 miles an hour? Well, I just, it's 36 is what it actually works out to. Oh, in terms of watts? If, in terms of miles per hour. If we set the requirement equal to the output, the very, very fastest we could go is if we take what we get, divide by the force we need, what's the speed that's left? And it's 16.1 oh, wow. meters per second. Oh, so 69504.7 divided by. Divided by four three oh seven. Point six newtons, and watts per newtons is meters per second. Well, ends up being watts divided by newtons yes. ends up being meters per second. Yes. Oh, okay. And then you convert that to miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So it's, it works out to 36 miles an hour, which it, I've never seen a road marked 36, um, but I've seen 40. And if the road were marked 40, the Corolla couldn't do it. Okay, so if it was marked 40, right, and the Corolla could do it, like, would the equation be like wrong, or is it just like sometimes stuff just happens? Like, or is it set in stone? It should not. No, no, no. It, it, I mean, if if we actually tried it, like we go back to CarMax and get the Corolla back and try it, and, and it's able to do it, that means somewhere along the way, an assumption that we made is inaccurate. Oh. There were two sort of really important assumptions we made that I think we would have to look sideways at. The efficiency and the resistance. So like with the numbers like certain, like set in stone, if something happens that's like not supposed to and it's wrong, like you did something wrong. 
Well. It's like saying everything is like certain tested a thousand times to, 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 and then the car still goes 40 miles per hour. Is it just like, you know, well, sometimes or is it like the math is always right? Well, I mean, all of our mathematics, it's only a model. It, it, it is only an attempt to explain what we see. What actually happens is obviously what actually happened. It's, it's not like we can point to the math and go, no, I disallow that. Well, no, it fucking happened. <laughs> you know, so like, it's... Uh, so like if that can happen, what's the point of doing that? We just we're trying very hard to, like, to put right together here. a good model. And the more so like could we have done this problem without the 700 newtons? Sure. Just for never mind air resistance, never mind friction, just start from here. Mg sine theta. We could have done that, but this is an attempt to Get, get a better model for a more accurate description and um if we had turned out to say that you know the corolla actually could not drive up all to redrive at 30 miles an hour like i i know that that's not true so there must be something in our model that needs adjusted oh. um sorry i'm going back to 16 point for a second is there a unit conversion you want us to use, or are you just asking? So, like going from miles per hour to meters per second, or meters per second to miles an hour? It's probably I'm this last exam. I'm asking every question. It's probably <laughs> easier to just look it up, yeah. But you can't do that for an exam. I'll tell you the one I use, but it's not good. Like, no. it, it is super inefficient. So, okay. 16.1 meters per second. I happen to know that one inch is 2.54 centimeters. Oh, God. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that one because it's exact. One inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. Mm -hmm. Which means I just need to keep track of all the other shit going on. Are we going to need to do this? So no. do I have to say okay. 2.54 or 2.5? Depends how precise you want to be. <laughs> All right, so seconds in the denominator, seconds, 3,600 seconds is one hour. One meter is 100 centimeters. One centimeter, no, 2.54 centimeters is one inch, 12 inches. Uh, in one foot and 5,280 feet in a mile. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Seconds. multiplying fractions is like my second favorite thing to do. So, What's your first? dividing fractions. <laughs> <laughs> I know, so but you get to multiply. You get to multiply by things that are upside down. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so is this thirty six point zero one five miles per hour? Is that the max it can go? If the hill is seventeen degrees, okay. exactly. Yep. If we do the analysis the other way and keep the speed limit at thirty and figure out how much force we can get from the engine and then set that here and solve for the angle. It works out to be like 21 degrees. So that there is a maximum steepness at 30 miles an hour as well. Because as you increase the angle, you increase the force requirement, which means our power requirement increases even at 30 miles an hour and eventually it'll even reach too far. I like this I like this demo a lot. 
Uh, I, I think it makes a really nice bookend. We started talking about it. We ended talking about this problem. But along the way, we got to define work, a new way to multiply vectors, kinetic energy, the work energy theorem, power. Are we going to go back to this page? Yes. Oh. Yeah, it is. Yep, I've got my wallet on the floor. As long as I stand here and watch it, it is not going to fall. Not from here. Cannot fall off the ground. Anyone who's had a little too much to drink can tell you that it's really hard to fall off the ground. <laughs> No matter what happens. How much net work was done? How far is it? Was it moving on the ground? Is it moving now? How much has its kinetic energy changed? None, right? Zero before, zero after, still zero, no change. So how much net work was done? Well, you're talking about the inanimate object. What about work that you did? That's a great question. I definitely did work. I needed to use a force through a displacement to do that. Absolutely. Suppose instead of a wallet, it's a 10 kilogram object and I lift it two meters. How much work did I do? Oh, oh. Work, force, dot, displacement. Ooh, they're in the same direction. I need to use a force equal to its weight in order to lift it. 10 kilograms, 9.8 meters per second squared, times 2 meters, 196 joules. Um, are you talking about gravity? No, we're talking about how much work I do. But in order to lift it at constant velocity, the net force needs to be zero. So my force needs to be equal to gravity. Yeah. Uh, if I pulled any more, it would accelerate and it wouldn't be at constant velocity. Uh, wait. Sorry. So if you're pulling up on something in the same in, in one direction, but it's opposite of gravity, mm -hmm. then you're just going to use gravity. So like the normal force pushing up to keep this thing right here at constant velocity, mm -hmm. the normal force has to be equal to gravity, right? Yes. Great. So what if the constant velocity weren't zero, but were one meter per second? Same story, the acceleration has to be zero. So the forces have to cancel. So whatever downward force there is, gravity, the upward force has to be equal and opposite. Of the gravity. Right. Otherwise there would be some net force and there would be some acceleration. Okay, so, so the MV that you broke there is talking about gravity. It's my applied force, which I know how strong it is because I need to counteract gravity. You know the applied force. Oh. You know. So applied force opposite of gravity is um, gonna be equal to gravity. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Cool. Technically, this is the work done by the applied force, but we know that it's equally rapid. Okay. All right. How much work does gravity do since we're on that question? Is gravity acting? Yes. Is there a displacement? Yes. Great. So we have to multiply. The force of gravity has the same magnitude, 98 newtons. The displacement is the same, two meters. What's different? It's going down. It's the opposite direction of the displacement. The dot product will get us cosine of the angle between up and down, 180, which gets us a minus sign. What? A, it gets us a minus sign. So gravity does negative 196 joules. Suppose we push a 10 kilogram object four meters of a frictionless ramp inclined at 30 degrees, also at constant velocity. How much work do we do in this case? Well, all right. A frictionless ramp, you say. Box, gravity, normal force, applied force. I know how to do this. Some of the forces in the x direction, constant velocity needs to be zero. Our applied force needs to equal mg sine 30 degrees. I'm skipping several steps. What about um, oh, Is that all right? Can I skip several steps? You all coming with me on that? Don't let me go on. Could you just, if you would get the apply for, I mean, the normal force on the Y, if you need that it's equal because it's that constant velocity. Yeah, so the normal yeah, force yeah. is okay. again equal to the Y component of gravity, but we don't need to know that. Okay. Because it's frictionless. Okay. Okay. How much work do I do? I needed to know how much force I had to apply to do that. That's that was the whole point here. So now we can calculate the work. That I do is my force dot the displacement mg sine thirty degrees. The displacement is four meters and they are in the same direction. So I get cosine of zero again. I should write that just to be on the safe side. And if you chase through the math, it is again 196 joules. What name do we give to the property that causes these two answers to be the same? Oh, that's a good question. The dot product. Its job is to squish the scenario onto gravity's number line. Right, we said we could multiply two vectors if they were along the same number line. So we knew how to do that. Gravity is a vertical thing. Sure, there is a displacement up the ramp at an angle. The displacement that gravity cares about is the vertical one. Imagine that you're over here with a light source shining this way. What's the vertical size of the shadow the ramp makes? Two meters. What it looks like to gravity 
is that we went up two meters. The fact that we did so at an angle, gravity doesn't care about that because gravity is a vertical thing. It only cares about the displacement that is along the vertical number line. It doesn't matter how we get two meters off the ground. We could have gone to the moon and back. We could have done this at a 0 0.0001 degree angle. We would have ended up in California, but if we were two meters off the surface, we would have done 196 joules of work because that's how much work gravity cares about. We need to do this at constant velocity. So we're just having a gravity conversation, really. Path independence, doesn't matter how we do it, which explains why if there is some steep terrain that you're gonna put a road on, usually we don't send the road directly up the mountain. It goes, like around, the path. It goes around and kind of back and forth, switchbacks, right? And they kind of snake up the face of the mountain to keep the slope small from being too steep so that the Corolla can actually do it because we're going to end up doing the same amount of work either way. That's cool. It just takes a little longer. So gravity, so gravity doesn't care about direction. Is what it cares only about work that we do along its direction. Sure, we've got a displacement this way, but if you collapse it onto gravity, it's two meters. That's what the dot product is doing. Our definition of work doesn't really care about what direction we're actually going. It cares about how things are, how their components are aligned. And also this side, no, I'm sorry. Um, the cos of zero degrees, that's just, say, that's just you saying that it's going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Technically, the dot product needs the cosine of the angle between them, which is zero. Oh, yeah. Right. So, in both of the above cases, how much net work was done? What about gravity? Zero. zero. Oh. How do you know it's zero? Because they're canceling each other out. Oh, because the gravity does negative 196 and they compress. Constant velocity, what a wonderful phrase. If the velocity is constant, can the kinetic energy have changed? No. If the kinetic energy didn't change, how much net work is done? Oh. Zero by the work energy theorem. So if velocity doesn't change, and that kinetic energy doesn't change, mm -hmm. and therefore doesn't change the work. The work done, the work done has to be zero. Okay. The net work done. But there's still work done. Sure. I lifted the thing, right? I pushed it up around. I got tired afterwards. That required effort from me. And what's different now. I lift my wallet, well, if I lift a 10 kilogram object two meters, what's different now? It can fall from here. Can't fall from down there. Something about the work that we do changes the story. The only reason it's two meters off the ground is because we did some work. But the work energy theorem as it exists doesn't tell us that story. It just says zero because no kinetic energy change. Suppose I stretch a spring. What happens? Oh, this is a sad spring. I tell you what, 
Let me try this instead. Oh, let's do it this way. Did I just do work? Yes. How much network was done? Zero. And the change in kinetic energy from beginning to end was zero. Yeah. But if I let go, am I going to hurt my laptop screen? Wait, sorry, I'm going to hurt my laptop screen if I let go. Or I'm going to hurt myself, right? These are keys. They hurt me or my laptop because they apply a force. I might actually be able to knock this can off the table. I might be able to push that can through enough displacement to knock it off the table. I might be able to, with keys, do work on that can. These are keys. They have no intrinsic ability to do work. See? <laughs> we can put them in contact even and nothing happens. Energy, we said, our definition for it was the ability to do work. If I release the keys, will they have kinetic energy? Yes. They will then have the ability to do work, but they don't now. No. Where did they get that ability? We gave it to the potential energy. We gave it to them. Exactly. And we stored the work that we did because gravity zeroes out the net effect, but we're able to bank the work that we did stored in this configuration relative to this one. Potential energy is not a thing that keys just have. It's something that we have relative to where we were. It's all about the configuration. The fact that they could move from here, potentially, there is some sort of energy that's in a savings account that we could withdraw from. The negative work done by gravity, because what force is it that means that they now have kinetic energy? If I stop holding them, what force is it that accelerates them? What force? Um, gravity. Gravity. Yeah. gravity on the way down does positive work. On the way up, gravity does negative work. So it cancels out? So it cancels out. In the closed loop, gravity doesn't do any work. We're back where we started. Mm -hmm. But we can take advantage of the fact that along the way up, gravity does negative work. Negative work is like the debit that shows up in your checking account when you make a deposit to your savings account, right? You get a credit in your savings account because you transferred money, but that shows up as a debit in your checking account. That's a negative number, but it works out to positive savings. There's energy stored in your savings account. Would you like to spend it as kinetic energy? You've just got to transfer it back. We can decrease our savings, transfer it into our checking account, and now we have money to spend. We have the ability to do some work with our money. <laughs> this trick works with gravity and springs. End of list. The only two kinds of forces that we are allowed to set up savings account buckets for are gravity 
and elastic behavior. So are ladders. Yes. Is that a, a hint that we should take a break sometime soon? <laughs> no, I, just, I was just learning about stepping on it. Oh. Okay, so what is the goal again? They can equal zero? I'll, I'll say a little bit more because we have some questions to answer that'll just kind of put this in perspective. But elastic behavior, right? We bend the meter stick. The meter stick now, when it flexes back and restores elastically its original form, we have deformed the thing elastically. That was a nice <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that we do get a slap when we actually snap the meter stick back, that's the meter stick being able to do work that we transferred back from our potential energy savings account with the bent meter stick. In the bent configuration, there is energy to be found in the savings account. When we transfer it back, then we can do something with it. We could do work on something else by kinetically smacking into it. So suppose you apply 20 newtons of force to stretch a spring one meter. How much work did you do? Twenty joule. Force times displacement. But how much Network was done. So stretch the spring and hold it there. Zero. If you release the spring, what would it do? It would snap back. Would it have kinetic energy? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So what can we argue happened to the work that we did? It released itself. In the meantime, before it was released, um, it was stored in the configuration of the stretch spring. So when I lift my wallet off the floor, what happens to the work that I did? That's stored. It got stored in the configuration of this object and the earth. I've edited the configuration. I have used gravity to make a deposit to my gravitational savings account. It shows up as a gravity flavored debit in my checking account. Gravity does negative work on the way up. If I want to spend that money, I can put it back into my checking account. Gravity can do kinetic things with it. Stored as potential energy in the configuration of the thing. Yeah. Drop your card. Shit. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, but how um for number 12, what network was done, we're not told that it's constant velocity. That's but true. We're, but we're talking, but we're saying in the direction of displacement. Stretch it and hold it there. So the spring. So what was the kinetic energy change from beginning to end? Spring started at rest. Oh, and we stretch it and it ends oh. at rest. Okay. Elastic and gravity are conservative forces, forces for which we have bank accounts. Forces for which we might be interested in talking about potential restored energy. Friction is a non conservative force. There's no way to get friction to do zero work in a closed path. We said gravity does negative on the way up, positive on the way down, exactly as much. Sliding across the table, friction does negative work because it acts opposite the displacement. <laughs> Slide it back, friction still does negative work opposite the displacement. 
no matter what we do, friction will always do negative work. It, we will never get a closed path zero from friction. But what about if you moved it in just one direction? <laughs> friction does negative work. And now as much as we would like to watch this eventually become released from this configuration, there's no, there's no savings account associated with this. I can't transfer some energy back and have it move on its own mm -hmm. under the influence of friction. Friction doesn't do that. Oh, Only so gravity. That that yeah. Oh. The net work done was zero, just like when I lifted the thing two meters. But there's no savings account associated with this one. I can't get back any of the work that I did. If I lift a thing, that work that I did, I can get back at by dropping it. If I slide a thing against friction, I can't get that back. Okay. It's like if you rub your hands together, you convert your bodily chemical potential energy into mechanical energy, and then the friction converts that into thermal energy, which warms up your hands and then leaks out of your body and you can't get that back friction doesn't make deposits to savings accounts for you it just it's like a transaction fee uh okay so with your hands and stuff it gets warm right well like where does the friction go for this one Oh wow! And heat, right? Yeah, if you did that fast, if it was like a stick that you were trying to make a fire with. What did you just do? I just <laughs> something's got to move the air molecules between the can and you. Friction acts to dissipate the energy that we have. It, it leaks out of the system. The other example of a non-conservative force, you might be surprised, is people forces, applied forces. I like this demo, it's fun. No matter what direction I push the paper, it always moves in the direction I'm pushing. It never, I can never do backwards. I can never get negative work by pushing on something. Can't be done. I, I can push it and it'll move that way, but I, I can only do positive work like that. If you say, okay, sure, we'll pull on it. Fine, but now I'm applying a force this way and it's moving this way and that's still positive work. Oh. Well, if I've actually pushed it up the hill, then I do positive work. If I let go and it goes downhill, that's gravity. There are weird corner cases that have to do with allowing a thing to move down. Technically, yes, I'm applying a force and it's opposite the displacement and it's a little bit awkward, but safest to assume that people forces are not conservative. Electromagnetic forces very often are conservative. Magnets are tricky. Uh, because they have to do with charges and motions, and then you've got inertial problems. But yeah, uh, electric forces, certainly. Uh, but we won't talk about those. The only forces we'll consider that have potential energy associated with them are basically springs and gravity. Tension, normal, applied, um, friction all of the other sort of usual suspects of forces that show up in our free body diagrams are all non-conservative.
the work energy theorem is what it was. But suppose we wanted to separate the two flavors. Conservative forces doing work and non conservative forces doing work. It's the gravity that is conservative. When I pull my keys on the lanyard to one side, yes, I'm doing work, but that's not a conservative thing. It's gravity. Gravity is what allows me to get back the energy I put in. So it's the conservative term that has to do with the stored energy. Remember, making a deposit to your savings account leaves a debit in your checking account. That minus sign is real. I can't store except by taking away from what I have. I can't go put that energy in a bucket except by removing the energy I had. Somebody's got to do negative work to do that. It's got to be gravity. So it's the negative work that is associated with how much we store. So we could, if we wanted to, move that to the other side. Minus the work done by conservative forces. So negative work has to do with stored energy how? Well, in order to get energy stored in a configuration, a conservative force has to do negative work. So this negative, the minus sign here, and the work done by conservative forces, minus the work done, that's the storage, right? A negative work done by conservative forces, that's stored energy. So we might change the bookkeeping and call it potential energy change. Why, wait, sorry, why you because a conservative force has to do negative work in order to store positive energy. So the negative negative? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the easiest way to think about it. Okay. It could also be that this the net work done by conservative forces is positive, in which case writing it this way has to mean that the change in potential energy is negative. Suppose we let the keys swing back the other way. Gravity does positive work on the way down. So this thing is positive. Minus. If we write it with a plus sign, that means this term has to be negative. Oh, okay. We, in order to let gravity do that, we had to withdraw from savings to put it back in our checking account so gravity could spend it. So potential energy is always negative? No. Sorry. It's <laughs> just that the minus the plus is part of the definition. Oh, okay. If general... this is positive, this is going to be negative because that minus sign is going to handle that. If this is negative, this is going to be positive because that minus sign handles it. Okay. Okay. What does what does that do for us? <laughs> I'm I'm so glad you asked. Let's take a break. Nice. A lot of work learning about work. I know, right? It's very meta. Very meta. Very what? Meta. It's work about work. <laughs> <laughs>